Well, thank you everyone. I know um, we've been here annually for a few years now, so we always appreciate the opportunity to present to all of you. Um, are you actually seeing the slides? I want to make sure everybody can see that. Okay, John's nodding. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so again, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is a really good way um, to fulfill some of your fiduciary responsibilities, provide a reminder as far as what those responsibilities are. Um, and although some of this may be a repeat for many of you, it is a good refresher. And we do have a, a few new updates we can provide, um, including a new United States Supreme Court court case that I think you'll find interesting and insightful. As we go through the presentation, um, we're happy to take questions as we go, or if you wanna hold them to the end, that's fine too, um, whatever you're comfortable with. And we'll try to also monitor the chat feature for those that are interested in using that as well. So this is kind of the outline of what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna set, um, the overview of the fiduciary basics. We like covering the basics, even though, again, it's something you've all probably heard before because it does help level set everybody and bring us back to the correct mindset of where we are and um, where we're going with this. Then fiduciary duties in connection with um, funding and investments, an overview of current litigation, best practices for mitigating liability, which everybody's interested in, other topics to watch, um, that includes proxy voting, ESG, which for those of you that have been following the ESG, it's sort of a pendulum that goes back and forth depending on um, the political party that's, that's in charge. And then um, a new topic we're covering this year is small balance cash outs and achievement, which again, I think you'll find really interesting and we should be able to have a good discussion about that. So the board's role, role as a fiduciary. So when we talk about fiduciary duties, it's important to keep in mind that there are fiduciary responsibilities and settler responsibilities. The settler here is the state of Delaware. And the settler in general is not considered a fiduciary. So although they set the terms of the plan and give the authority to the fiduciary, the board, the settler it's themselves is not a fiduciary. The plans management board has a lot of responsibilities and um, is in charge of several different types of plans, including um, the 457, the 401A defined contribution, the 403B plan. Um, and when we talk about those plans, the fiduciary roles and responsibilities and the code requirements are generally the same. So you'll see a lot of overlap in our conversation with respect to that. Then there's also the 529 plan and the ABLE plan, which are sort of their own animal. Although the fiduciary responsibilities, fiduciary principles in general apply, when we talk about the uh, 401A requirements, 457B requirements, those don't translate as easily. So the 529 is a little bit of a, of a different animal and we'll try to talk about that. Rob uh, particularly will break that out in how um, those responsibilities might differ. Delaware code defines fiduciary pretty broadly. Um, it includes any trustee or agent to the extent delegated duties by another fiduciary. So who is a fiduciary? For the plans, it includes the members of the plan management board. And the next slide, we're going to talk about the definition of a fiduciary. But here, um, the board is a fiduciary both by designation, meaning like we just talked about the code specifically says they're a fiduciary, but also by function. So the board has uh, the authority to improve, approve investment options, approve the annual budget for the plans, perform annual audits. And then there can be other fiduciaries, depending on the circumstances. Oftentimes we'll see that with an investment committee, investment advisors or consultants can be fiduciaries. So how does the code define fiduciary? Um, 
two ways. An a individual or entity can be a fiduciary by function or by designation. Oops. By designation um, just simply means the plan or a rule stays, states that they are a fiduciary. So that's fairly straightforward. And as we talked about, the Delaware Code does state that the board will be a fiduciary. But an individual or entity can also be a fiduciary by function. And what that means is that the individual has the authority um, to make discretionary administrative or investment decisions related to the plan. Um, so, this can include anyone who chooses, evaluates, or monitors service providers, anyone who can bind the plan through contracts. And what's important here is the key is having the authority. So, it's not actually the implementation of the authority or actually making those decisions. It's just having the capacity to make the decision, the right to make the decision that can make somebody a fiduciary. So throughout this presentation, we're going to talk about several sources of fiduciary duties. And there really is no one source. So that's why we look through to all of these uh, various sources. So under federal law, it can be the Internal Revenue Code. So we'll, you'll see a lot of code citations. Also ERISA. So ERISA is not directly applicable um, to a governmental plan, but oftentimes the ERISA sources are the best guidance that we have um, and can act sort of as a safe harbor, um, given that the Internal Revenue Code doesn't have a, as much express uh, guidance as ERISA does. So you'll hear us talk about ERISA-like standards. We may cite ERISA, but again, ERISA does not apply to a governmental plan. State law, so statutory fiduciary rules, state constitution, and then we'll look at common law. So you'll see references to the restatement third of trust, which is just a collection of common law. When we talk about common law, what we're talking about is a collection of cases, general authority. Um, um, PERSA, so that's the Uniform Management of Public Employee Retirement Systems Act. It, even if not expressly adopted, again, like ERISA, it provides really good guidance. And then we'll look at the plan documents, statutes, trust documents, policies, all of this help to make up the sources for fiduciary duties. What's important to keep in mind is that all powers held as a trustee are held in a fiduciary capacity. Um, and this includes the right to not make a decision um, is a fiduciary decision. So that's just a reminder that when you're sitting on the board, you are acting as a fiduciary in every decision or non-decision that you make. So we're gonna cover three broad categories of fiduciary duties. And this is just a highlight, a preview of what's to come. So when we, and you'll see a lot of overlaps, especially between the duty of loyalty and the duty of prudence, you'll see a lot of overlap, although the duties are different. So the duty of loyalty, we'll talk about the duty to act impartially among the differing interests, independently, without conflicts of interest, act solely in the interest of participants and beneficiaries. This is also known as the exclusive benefit rule, if you hear that term, and then act exclusively for the purpose of providing benefits and paying reasonable plan expenses. The duty of prudence, so the duty to diversify investments, um, that's where we'll talk about some of the recent case law and what that means. The duty to act exclusively for the purpose of providing benefits and paying reasonable expenses. Again, there's that overlap between the duty of prudence and the duty of loyalty. The duty to act with the care, skill, prudence, and diligence of a prudent person familiar with like matters. So remember that phrase, familiar with like matters, because that's a heightened standard. So we're going to talk about that as well. And the duty to delegate responsibilities outside of experience, expertise. Um, and we'll talk about what that looks like and how to do that prudently and how to document that those types of decision delegations. And then the duty to follow the plan document. This is um, the only slide where we talk about that uh, because it's really a straightforward concept in theory. And that is that there is a fiduciary duty to administer the plan, quote unquote, by the book, meaning following the terms of the plan document. 
um, making consistent interpretation and administration of the plan document. So certainly there are times where the plan document is vague with respect to how to handle certain circumstances. And so um, the board and, and the executives may have authority to interpret the plan document, but what's important is that that interpretation be consistent, meaning that if a similar fact sh should arise in the future, that a similar interpretation is given to the plan document. Timely update the plan for uh, legally required changes. I know uh, you guys have been working on that with John and Jason. You know, it used to be a couple years ago, we could say, well, there really aren't much changes, you know, uh, that have happened, but we can't say that anymore because there have been a lot of changes um, under the Secure Act, under the CARES Act. Uh, there's a secure 2.0 that may be coming. Um, we're kind of watching Washington to see what changes will come out of that, if any. So there have actually been uh, requirements to keep the plan updated. So that's an important fiduciary duty and timely correct plan errors. So Rob and I probably spend about half of our practice helping plans correct errors. Um, errors certainly happen. Um, you're working with uh, billion dollar plus plans with thousands upon thousands of members and retirees, and there are bound to be errors. And so it's important to keep in mind that there is a fiduciary duty to correct those plan errors. Sometimes we get the question when errors arrive, arise, um, can we just waive it? Can we just move on? Um, what's the chances of the IRS auditing us? Um, we hear their resources are limited. Are they actually auditing governmental plans? And the answer to that is you have a fiduciary duty. So it's, it's not a matter of are you going to be caught? It's a matter of um, fulfilling your fiduciary duty. Um, certainly the IRS does have limited resources as we all know, but the fact of the matter is we are aware of, um, in fact, one state that's under a, a active IRS audit. So it's not out of the realm of possibility, but more importantly, it is part of your fiduciary duty to make those corrections to, and do so timely. And with that, I will turn it over to Rob to start fiduciary duties. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Audra, and good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk first about the duty of loyalty, as Audra mentioned. Uh, next slide. And um, in the overview, Audra showed you the four different components of the duty of loyalty. And the first one we want to talk about is the exclusive benefit rule. In the red box, you have a quote from uh, internal. Go back. There you go. Uh, from Internal Revenue Code Section 401A2, and this is where we uh, the exclusive benefit rule comes from. There's some important components to the rule. The first is where it says under the trust instrument. That means that this has to be part of the written plan document or the written trust agreement. Uh, and that in that uh, plan document, in those plan terms, it has to be impossible before the satisfaction of all liabilities with respect to employees and their beneficiaries. And that means that um, before the plan is terminated and all liabilities uh, have been paid, all benefits have been paid under the plan, then it's impossible for the principle of the trust or the income of the trust to be used or diverted for other purposes other, other than the exclusive benefit of the members, the participants, or their beneficiaries. So you really can see how it breaks down between a written requirement and impossibility and that the trust funds be used exclusively for uh, the members and their beneficiaries. As I mentioned, this is uh, in code section 401A2, so it certainly applies to the 401A DC plan, but you have similar provisions under code section 403 uh, and under 457. Each have their own version of the exclusive benefit rule. 
Delaware Code Section 2722 also sets out a standard of care and incorporates the duty of loyalty. And then uh, we've given you a citation to the Code of Conduct, which has similar provision. Uh, next slide, Audra. But as Audra mentioned, we want to distinguish that uh, those plans which have this exclusive benefit rule are distinct from the 529 and the ABLE plans, which are not governed by those code sections. Instead, they're governed by the common law of trusts, and they have certain uh, expenses which are ex uh, expressly allowed by statute. Um, again, uh, under uh, 29 Delaware Code 2722, which allows the use of administrative fees to pay reasonable expenses from 529 and ABLE, uh, and then further uh, permits the administrative fund to pay specific expenses. I want to also touch on the exclusive benefit rule allows for the payment of reasonable administrative expenses, and there's a whole um, understanding of what constitutes a reasonable administrative expense. As Audra said, uh, ERISA doesn't apply, but ERISA has a body of regulation and law that uh, identifies that. But here you have uh, express allowance for certain types of expenses under the 529 and ABLE plans, including salaries, marketing expenses, and other administrative expenses. Next slide, Audra. Again, we've given you uh, additional breakdown of the exclusive benefit rule with regard to each of the plans here. Next slide, please. And then just from a practical impact um, that the uh, for you as board members, when you think about the ex exclusive benefit rule, that the benefits must be payable in accordance with the plan terms and that the plan assets must only be used to pay those benefits and reasonable expenses of the plan. And you're using your settler versus fiduciary function analysis for determining reasonable expenses. Uh, John and Jason uh, are fully familiar with uh, that analysis. And again, that goes back to uh, the development of law under ERISA and the Department of Labor. Next slide, please. After the exclusive benefit rule, uh, the next uh, sub uh, fiduciary duty under the duty of loyalty is the duty of independence. Um, and this means that the trustee must be independent of any uh, preconceived notions. Um, we've given you a citation to a famous case with regard to the development of fiduciary duties and fiduciary law. Um, and I like the, uh, the quote that says a trustee is held to something stricter than the morals of the marketplace. Um, as Audra mentioned, uh, um, Perza, uh, that independence required uh, permits the trustee to perform the duties uh, aside from the face of pressure from others who are not subject to such obligations. Next slide. Again, uh, Delaware Code Chapter 58 establishes laws regulating the code, the conduct of officers and employees. Um, the board's required to arrange for an annual financial audit of each of the plans. And um, you've got case law that establishes an absolute prohibition on self-dealing by uh, trustees. Next slide. So really, when you think about the, uh, what we've just talked about in impartiality under the duty of loyalty means that the fiduciary owes a duty of loyalty to all participants and beneficiaries and requiring the fiduciary to be impartial among differing interests uh, within the plans. Next slide, Audra. 
sometimes that means that you may have to balance the interests of retirees versus active participants. Um, you might have to balance the interests of different groups of participants. But for you, um, especially because you have oversight of more than one plan, that means that you have to balance your role with regard to each of the different plans and trusts. Next slide, Audra. Thank you. Again, this uh, is from Umperza, um, and I, I just like here where it says that the duty of impartialities does not mean that you must accommodate interests according to a notion of absolute equality, but that you must uh, make your decisions carefully after weighing the differing interests. Next slide. So as we think about the duty of loyalty from a practical impact, um, I want you to think about the fact that you're required to act in the interest of the trust as if you have no other competing interest to protect. Um, that means you can't act for your own interest. You uh, should not be influenced by the interests of a third person or the plan sponsor. And depending on how you come to the board, you may have to put aside the interests of the party that appoints you or elects you to a, a position. Um, and we uh, point out here what's referred to as the two hat rule. Sometimes it's referred to as the one hat rule, but that means that you have a hat of being the agent for the party that appoints you or elects you. And as you come to the board, then you have to take that hat off and put on uh, your hat of being a fiduciary um, loyal to uh, the, the plan, the members and beneficiaries. Again, this requires undivided loyalty. And here, oh, go back there. You, and here we've given you a uh, citation to uh, two different cases. Uh, forward one slide, Audra. The Su Suida versus uh, University of Pennsylvania case and the Hosier uh, case, again, that reinforce this two hat rule that you're acting solely in the interests of the participants and beneficiaries. And with that, Audra, that covers the duty of loyalty and I'll turn it back to you for the duty of prudence. Thanks, Rob. So the Delaware Code incorporates the duty of prudence. Um, and what's important here is that it requires the board to act with the care, skill, prudence, and diligence then prevailing. So at the time the decision is made, so then prevailing, that a prudent person acting in a like capacity and familiar with such matters would use. And what's important here is, as I kind of previewed in the beginning, if this is a heightened standard, so it's not just a prudent person standard. So sometimes we hear um, legal terms, a reasonable person, a prudent person. Here, it's not just a prudent person. It's a prudent person who's familiar with such matters. So this is, is this is a higher standard. Um, so let's take an example of investment selection. Um, it's not good enough to just do your best in making those investment selections. Instead, um, as a board and as a fiduciary, you would be held to the standard of a person making an investment selection who's familiar with investments. So where, where this comes into play then is sometimes board members say, well, I don't have all of the expertise. And that's not expected. So um, when we think about investment selections, actuarial science, um, legal questions, you're not going to have all of the expertise. So this is where it's important to delegate. So a fiduciary is able to delegate functions that a prudent fiduciary acting in a like capacity would properly delegate. So again, this comes back to that concept that every decision um, when you're sitting as, as a fiduciary is held in a fiduciary capacity. So there are certainly times where not only can a fiduciary delegate, 
but the prudent thing is to delegate again, particularly when we talk about those topics, issues that require a particular expertise. But the delegation must be done in a prudent manner and it cannot be overly broad and must be done um, consistent with the duties of care and caution. So this means there often needs to be a process um, to delegate. And if this is a written process, then that written process should be followed. So how do you go about delegating? Um, again, delegation is a fiduciary act. So um, the documentation should be clear and consistent. The specific duties that are being delegated should be set out in writing. And not, and not only should those be approved by the fiduciary, but the individual or entity to whom you are delegating to should be required to accept those in writing as well. So you have acknowledgement that yes, we are delegating these parameters to you. Um, we are signing it as the fiduciary and you are signing it as accepting that responsibility. And then you must monitor um, the delegation, but let's back up for a second. When we talk about delegating, um, it's important to consider that the person or entity that you're delegating to is the person or entity that has that expertise that you're looking for. So, um, consideration should be given to their experience, their credentials, fees, the ability to perform the function. And when we talk about fees, it's important to consider fees, but it's also important to not get too wrapped up in the fees. So sometimes the individual or entity with the greatest expertise and experience and the right one for the job may not be the cheapest one. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't consider them. In fact, it just means you need to weigh those options, consider their credentials with their fees to make a prudent selection and documenting that process as well. An objective criteria should be used and it should be written as written as far as what was considered and why it was considered. Um, and then monitoring. So there is a continuing duty to monitor. Um, we will talk about some case law that um, solidifies that continuing duty to monitor. And fees and costs must be reasonable and not only reasonable on the front end, but again, keeping in mind that continuing duty to monitor. So let me give a quick example. So, for example, if the uh, board prudently delegates certain responsibilities to an investment committee and also is prudent in the selection of those committee members documented correctly, um, proper consideration given, if that committee then doesn't act prudently, the board is not responsible for that committee's actions so long as there was not a failure in the board's duty to monitor. So if done properly, this really can uh, be a great tool to use. Um, Delaware code provides the authority to secure expertise. So the board is entitled to do that um, as well. There is a duty to diversify um, unless it would be imprudent to not diversify. And the Delaware code states that the board has the power and duties to maintain, invest, and reinvest those funds um, pursuant to a standard of care. So the board does have a duty to diversify um, and continue to monitor those investments. So we've talked about the Tibble case before. The Tibble case was a uh, 2015 case where the Supreme Court held that there was a continuing duty to monitor trust investments and re remove imprudent ones. And this involved allegations of investment share classes versus retail share classes where retail share classes um, were more expensive. And, and in the theme of history sort of repeats itself, then we had a new Supreme Court case, um, Hughes versus Northwestern. And the claims were similar. The claims were um, that uh, Northwestern University failed to monitor and control fees, that they offered mutual funds and annuities in the form of a retail share class that carried higher fees than um, institutional share classes, and that there were 
too many investment options. So that caused um, investment paralysis. And the Seventh Circuit dismissed the case. The Seventh Circuit said, listen, these institutional class shares that you're asking for were already available options. If you didn't choose them, that's sort of on you. Um, it was an investment, it was an investment option that was available to you. And we think that they fulfilled their duty to diversify. So there really was a focus from the Seventh Circuit on the duty to diversify. And it went up to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court disagreed with the Seventh Circuit, um, citing Tibble. And the Supreme Court said, no, um, it's not just this duty to diversify, but fiduciaries have a duty to monitor and remove imprudent investments in a timely manner. And what's interesting um, is the Supreme Court acknowledged the fact there were too many options available. And by too many, Northwestern had over 400 different investment options that were available to participants. So the Supreme Court acknowledged that um, there certainly, although those options were available, there were 400 investment options and that it's not enough for a fiduciary to offer an array of investment options. Instead, that fiduciary actually has a duty uh, to monitor those investment options. And if options seem imprudent, they have a duty to remove those. So it's not just a duty to diversify, but to be thoughtful in the diversification that's offered. So again, this is just setting forth a continuing duty to monitor and um, remove any imprudent investment options. So the practical impact is that um, the board has a responsibility or the committee, a committee if it's been delegated to conduct regular investment reviews, comparing with peer groups and benchmarking, comparing expenses and asset classes, determining which investments should be placed on a watch list or replaced, and adopting or if the one's already been adopted, um, following an investment policy statement and regularly reviewing that. Rob will talk about when he talks about the litigation um, concerns with having well-written policies that aren't followed. So certainly if there are policies, those should be regularly reviewed and followed. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob to talk about litigation. Thanks, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, Audra. And why don't we go to the next slide? For uh, those of you that uh, we've uh, done this with before, some of this background Audra's just talked about with regard to the Hughes versus Northwestern case. But um, in the mid 2000s, uh, there began to, we began to see a series of cases against 401k plan sponsors alleging breaches of fiduciary duties. Some of those cases had relatively significant settlements. Uh, we've set forth a couple of them here. And that's important because each of those settlements comes with fairly large attorney's fees and uh, the same law firms or some of the same law firms that were involved in the 401k cases then have been involved in the more recent 403b cases that started in uh, 2016. These uh, were cases filed against very large private universities and hospitals. Um, we recognize that the nature of 403B plans kind of lended to uh, some of the claims of breach of fiduciary duty. But it's important to note that uh, by bringing the cases against private universities and hospitals, they were able to bring these cases under ERISA standards. Um, we think that the learning lessons from these cases, though, certainly apply uh, over to governmental uh, fiduciaries, especially with similarly situated plans. Next slide. In general, uh, in, in the 403, 403B cases, uh, the claims were very similar to those related to uh, the 401K cases. Um, we noted that uh, most of these cases have settled or were dismissed, but certainly with the Northwestern case going up to the Supreme Court and the court allowing for the claims to proceed, there is going to continue to be additional development 
of the law uh, coming out of that case. Um, and uh, we think that uh, based upon what we're seeing from these cases, that there's the possibility of additional litigation uh, exploring similar claims against governmental plans, but we've not seen specific uh, lawsuits uh, uh, yet. Next. This is from the University of Pennsylvania case. It's a quote that uh, where the judge said that the analysis of the fiduciary standards is the same. And we use this uh, because it's important to point out that the fiduciary standards from a 403B case to a 401K case are the same, um, just as they would be for a 401A uh, defined contribution plan or a 457B plan. Next. Audra talked about the Hughes versus Northwestern case, and we've given you some additional information here. The important part being the second bullet that the Supreme Court held that there's an ongoing duty to monitor investments and the fact that having many good investments uh, it is not determinative and would not excuse the inclusion of poor investments. So it's really an ongoing duty to monitor and to monitor the full range of investment options. Next order. As we've talked about before, when uh, plaintiffs file these claims, they want a variety of relief class certification and we uh, that's important because if a class gets certified immediately the cases become more expensive to defend and have greater risk associated with them they want declarations of breach of fiduciary duty uh, restoration of losses uh, removal of uh, fiduciaries in certain uh, cases uh, reformation of plan investments or removal of plan uh, investment options, and then attorney's fees, all of which is why you see going back to the Lockheed Martin and the Boeing cases, why they can be expensive from a settlement perspective. Next, Audra. In the 403B cases, the defendants have been the colleges and universities themselves, but it's also been members of the investment committees and individual board members, as well as individual employees who had specific responsibilities for the plans. Um, some of the cases also have included claims against the investment advisors and the consultants, um, depending on the role that the advisors and consultants played. Next. But as Audra mentioned earlier, a real lesson to take away from these cases is that a single claim can be brought under either the duty of loyalty or the duty of prudence. So, for instance, too many investment options has been a claim of a breach of duty of loyalty and a claim of a breach of the duty of prudence. Uh, investments which favor the record keeper we see in under both duties uh, excessive fees we see under both duties and uh, a highlight to make is that under the duty of prudence a flawed process for selecting and monitoring investments uh, is one that we th we think uh, there are great uh, lessons to take away from because uh, in uh, some of the cases, they might have had a very good process uh, uh, in their investment selection, but then not following the process that the board had uh, uh, selected uh, is something that, that we've seen and where cases have been able to continue. And then locked in arrangements with vendors, and that's very unique to uh, uh, 403B plans for sure. But we certainly see where plans have a record keeper and may not have regular RFP uh, processes to uh, 
oversee or monitor how the record keeper is doing in, in relation to what you might be able to get from other record keepers. Next, Audrey. And so with that kind of backdrop, I think that leads to a good discussion of what are the best practices for how to mitigate liability and Audrey, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks. So we'll be able to go through some of these slides fairly quickly because we try to work in the mitigating liability as we're talking about each topic, but this is sort of a bring it back home. What do we need to do discussion? But we also want to save time because we have some really interesting topics at the end that we want to make sure we cover as well. So there is um, the board and the subcommittees have indemnity um, for actions of good faith. So, um, assuming that as board members, you don't act with malice or ill will, um, there is statutory indemnification available. Um, during this, typically when we give this type of presentation, we also talk about whether it makes sense to have fiduciary insurance. Um, we understand that the, the state of Delaware is unique and that there are legal reasons why you do not want to consider that. So, again, that's part of your fiduciary duties is considering that, but we understand there's a great basis to not have that, but you do have statutory indemnification available for you. So, importantly, the focus is on the process and, and this is something that is important to keep in mind. So, you're not insurers of decisions. Instead, was a prudent decision made at the time based on the information available at the time the decision was made. It's not a backwards looking standard and this is important when we're talking about um, investments, of course, because nobody can predict what's going to happen with the economy or the market. So instead, it's a prudent process. And there can be many uh, different decisions that could have been made that were prudent, but it's just was a prudent process followed. And so this is why you'll hear us continually say, document the process, document the, the, the reasons for the decision, because when things happen later in the future, you can go back and say, but this was our basis for it. It was thought out. This is why we considered alternative options and why those were ultimately rejected. There are ways to adopt processes. Um, it can be through a governance manual, vendor management, cybersecurity or other policies, charters for committees, investment policy statements. Those are all ways to document a written prudent process. And as Rob talked about with the litigation, um, these documentation types of documentations are important, but it's also important that those processes are followed and those individuals who are involved in the committees know that those processes are out there. Um, conduct regular periodic fiduciary training, which um, your board does a great job of making sure it's done on an annual basis and makes it a requirement um, for the board to participate as well. Um, allocating expertise in writing, retaining that expertise when needed, um, and conducting financial and management audits as well on a regular basis. This talks about how to um, monitor and keep up to date, um, getting competitive bids. Many um, boards have requirements that every three to five years, uh, they have to go out to bid um, certain types of work to make sure that not only um, are the fees reasonable at the time that the agreement is entered, but that the fees stay reasonable over the life of the pro project as well. We talked about this um, when we talked about delegation of duties. Consider fiduciary insurance. Again, you have reasons in Delaware why that may not be a good idea, but you have in indemnification available. So with that, we're, we're excited to um, talk about other topics to watch and also talk about achievement and small balances as we wrap up our, our day with you. Thanks, Audra. Next slide. These two topics are very much related. Uh, ESG, environmental social governance uh, concepts in investing, and then uh, the board's 
um, activism or not, or not as it relates to proxy voting. Uh, next slide. And as Audrey mentioned earlier on, this has been a uh, carousel, depending on which uh, political party has been uh, in uh, the White House. At a high level, it started under uh, President Clinton with a DOL interpretive bulletin that allowed for a prudent investor to consider a thorough consideration of the expected return on alternative investments with similar risk and reward factors. And that if the prudent investor had made that thorough consideration, then they could also consider the selection of an economically targeted investment and there would not be a violation of ERISA. And the, the uh, interpretive bulletin defined an economically targeted investment as an investment that selects for the economic benefits they create in apart from the investment return. This is kind of the first step in the development of ESG considerations. Now, again, I want to go back to one of the first points that Audra made. As a governmental plan, you are not subject to ERISA, and that means that then you're not subject to uh, the Department of Labor guidance, whether it's uh, these interpretive bulletins or other guidance that we're going to uh, look at. But because it's the greatest development of the law, I think that it is important to look at uh, what's happening under the ERISA uh, uh, analysis so that we can see how does that apply to us as we might consider our own duties in relation to ESG or in relation to proxy voting. That was in 94, then in 2008, towards the end of uh, the Bush administration, uh, George W. Bush administration, um, there was a pullback from the ESG factors uh, with another interpretive bulletin to say that the ESG factor could only be used as a tiebreaker if the alternative investments were economically equivalent. Next slide. And it observed that ERISA does not specifically provide a basis for selecting between economically uh, equivalent investments. So uh, if you had economically equivalent investments then, and you made a decision based upon an ESG factor, that would be consistent with ERISA. But you couldn't rely uh, only on ESG factors uh, in making that decision. Next. That was at the end of the Bush administration. Then uh, towards the end, not quite at the end, but towards the end of the Obama administration, there was another interpretive bulletin that came out of the Department of Labor uh, that clarified that fiduciaries should appropriately consider factors that potentially influence risk and return, and that ESG factors may have a direct relationship uh, to the economic value of the investment. Uh, going back to the 2008 bulletin, this also reiterated that it's important for the fiduciary to document the investment decision and the extent to which you've relied, that decision relied on ESG factors. Towards the very end of the Trump administration, go back uh, there, thank you. Um, the Department of Labor published, and when, when I say towards the very end, this is November of 20, so the election has happened. Um, we've only got two months less left in office, and the Department of Labor published its final rule on fiduciary duties. Uh, as it relates to ESG factors, it was referred to as the investment duties rule, and it goes back to the 2008 guidance from the Bush administration um, and says that a fiduciary evaluating investment can only base its action on pecuniary factors. Uh, next slide. 
and that the fiduciary may not subordinate the interests of participants and beneficiaries to other objectives or sacrifice investment return to take an additional investment risk or pr promote a non-pecuniary benefit. Early in the Biden administration then, in March of 2021, the DOL announced that it was not going to enforce that rule. Uh, it also said that the final rule would have a chilling effect on integration of ESG factors and that it was going to then issue its own uh, guidance. Next slide. And in October of 2021, it issued proposed regulations that would specifically permit fiduciaries to consider ESG factors. When the fiduciary finds that those factors are material to the risk return analysis, and that if you find that they're material, you can use them in selecting plan investments and in voting proxies. Uh, it called out that these factors could be climate change related factors, governance factors, or workforce practices. Um, those regulations have not been finalized. The comment period ended in December of 2021, and we've not yet had uh, further uh, guidance from the Department of Labor. But we expect to see more ESG-related guidance going forward. I want to stop there and point out that uh, you probably have seen that then in August, just uh, last month, 19 uh, state attorneys general sent a letter to uh, the head uh, or the CEO of BlackRock, which uh, accused BlackRock of using the hard earned money of our state's citizens to circumvent the best possible return on investment. The letter is focused only on energy um, uh, and focuses on uh, the goal of net zero emissions under the Paris Accord and then the Climate Action 100 plus uh, group, which is a group of investors which are integrating environmental policy into decision making. That uh, was uh, more recently followed, uh, at least here in Indiana, by uh, an opinion from the state attorney general that to use uh, ESG factors would be a violation of fiduciary duties. Uh, again, this opinion was only focused on uh, energy related investment and environmental considerations. Um, but it also said that to use investment advisors who consider uh, ESG factors would be a breach of fiduciary duty. Similar, uh, the Texas Comptroller issue uh, put BlackRock on a list of 10 financial companies that he had determined boycott energy companies. Uh, so we, sh we can see that this has become a very politicized uh, issue of consideration. I think the, uh, that we should look to see what uh, the DOL does with its proposed guidance. Um, and to the extent that there is interest uh, within governmental fiduciaries of considering ESG factors, there certainly is support for uh, doing so, but uh, depending on where the governmental fiduciary may be, there also is strong political pressure uh, not to do so. The next slides I'm just gonna uh, skip over because they follow the very same pattern um, in whether or not uh, the fiduciary should consider ESG as part of voting uh, proxies, just as the development we saw with regard to ESG factors, the same development has happened on proxies and whether or not a fiduciary should be uh, spending uh, plan assets 
to uh, evaluate the voting of proxies based upon these factors or to be um, more active in the voting of proxies. Um, and so that will will continue to see uh, development on. Um, as of uh, right now, there certainly are states where ESG factors are being considered. Uh, I know that uh, New Jersey has gotten press about uh, uh, fiduciary consideration of uh, net zero emissions under the Paris Accord and their uh, desire to have investments uh, supportive of that. Um, I would just also point out that there's um, a disconnect in some of the discussion because on the environmental side, uh, we have a lot of politicization of whether or not investments are supportive of energy companies. And, you know, I've already mentioned the Texas controllers uh, uh, blacklist, if you will. Uh, but then separately in some of those same states, there's a more aggressive approach to investments uh, uh, which might not be supportive of Israel. And we've seen development of state law uh, in that case, the targeting of Unilever with uh, Ben and Jerry's is one of uh, its holdings we've seen. And certainly that's very much a societal or a governance under the ESG. Um, and so we're gonna have to uh, continue to Kind of walk a fine line depending on where you are and uh, how uh, you might feel in terms of uh, considering ESG factors. But certainly there is support as, as we've seen the development of the guidance, there is support that ESG factors can be considered. It's, a, uh, it's gonna be a matter of whether you are considering them only after you've determined that the investment is uh, the best investment from a pecuniary standpoint, or whether you can consider those factors in evaluating um, the long-term risk uh, to the investment or the uh, reward from the investment. And I'll, I'll stop there, Audra, and turn it back to you. Thanks. So one new topic that we added this year um, is small balance cash outs and achievement. Um, we thought this would be a good time to cover the federal law requirements regarding small balance cash outs. And then with respect to a statement of funds considerations, because it does pull in fiduciary considerations when handing money over to the state. So small balance cash outs, the reason why a plan um, would want to do small balance cash outs and why plans do implement these types of features to plans is to clean up the small balances. So we're talking about um, those individuals that have a thousand, maybe 2,500 in the account. And those tend to be the participants that go lost or missing uh, because they don't have that large account there. Maybe they didn't work for the state for very long. So those tend to be the population that go lost and missing. So there are two reasons to clean it up. One are those small balance accounts where the fees may be eating up some of, of the small funds that are there. And also to try to take care in the, of in the future, those lost and missing participants. So the thought is if we can distribute these funds quickly, then um, we won't have that lost or missing participants in the future. But there are IRS requirements regarding the forcing of distribution of funds prior to the required beginning date. So with respect to distributions of $1,000 or less, we see that more often. So we more often see those small balance cash outs with $1,000 or less. And the reason for that is because the plan then is not subject to the automatic rollover requirements. And we'll talk about those on the next slide. Instead, the plan can simply just cash out the $1,000 and send it directly to the participant. Um, also, if you really have a small amount, um, if it's less than $200, uh, a special tax notice doesn't have to be provided, but if it's more than $200, the participant still has the right to roll it over. So they, they have the option to come in and request a direct rollover of their funds. If not, 
then the default can be if it's less than a thousand, we're just going to send you a check. Now for distributions above a thousand, we don't see that as often with respect to small balance. And the reason for that is because um, under federal law, it can't just be sent to the participant in a check. Instead, it has to be directly rolled over to an IRA. So this pulls in a lot of fiduciary decisions in that it would be the plan or the board who is setting up that IRA for the participant. So they have to go through a fiduciary process in doing that in making sure that the vendor that's selected to hold the IRA, the financial institution that's selected, is done through a fiduciary process, that the default investment options are prudent, um, that the fees are reasonable and stay reasonable. So it pulls in fiduciary concepts. Um, in the past as well, we didn't see a lot of institutions that were wanting to take these small balances. Um, it just wasn't something they had a desire to do. We're seeing more vendors starting to take them, um, starting to take those automatic rollovers, but again, um, you do have to go through a fiduciary process in selecting the financial institution, selecting the default investment options. So we really don't see that as often with our governmental clients. Instead, our governmental clients tend to retain the assets in a forfeiture account or in the participant's account and continue to try to contact those participants and get them to either roll over or take a distribution from their account. One question that we tend to get asked probably two to three times a year this comes up is, um, can we escheat it to the state's unclaimed property fund? Uh, there are various reasons why this is desired. Oftentimes the argument is, um, well, the, the unclaimed property has a really robust system for trying to find and locate these members. Um, we know people get on the unclaimed property site often to look for funds, um, and they really have better search tools than we have at the pension fund. That's one argument. Sometimes the pressure actually comes from the state itself saying, you know, turn over your assets to us. And, and there's different reasons why that that's desired um, from the state. Um, but we'll handle those separately. So with respect to the argument that the state has a more robust system for finding and locating the members and participants, um, what we see some state doing is they utilize the search tool itself or utilize the unclaimed property agency um, without actually turning over the funds. So the funds stay within the trust um, for the reasons that we'll talk about in just a second, um, but they're not actually turned over to the state. One state that we know that that does that uh, is Oklahoma. And there are a couple other states that that do that. They use the search searching aspect and go ahead and list them on unclaimed property without actually turning over the assets. A statement in governmental plan raises a couple unique issues that are not um, issues for an ERISA plan. Um, and one of those is the prohibited transaction. So keeping in mind that the state is the settler for a governmental plan, then turning funds back over to the settler can raise prohibited transactions. You're giving funds back to the settler. So that can raise concerns with prohibited transactions. It also can violate vesting provisions applicable to governmental plans that individuals are entitled to uh, be fully vested at normal retirement age. It can also raise concerns about violating the exclusive benefit rule. So keep in mind that funds are not supposed to be utilized for any purpose other than the exclusive benefit of uh, members and beneficiaries. So oftentimes the way unclaimed property is structured is that a certain percentage of those assets are held um, in an account, but not all of them. Um, the state has the right to use a certain percentage of those assets for various 
um, items, general fund, um, they have access to that, that account. So that raises issues with the exclusive benefit rule when the funds are not being used for the, the members and the beneficiaries. And then there are arguments that it violates the rollover rules. So that what we just talked about, the automatic rollover rules, an argument can be made that this escheatment is just another way of forcing a distribution out. And now you're no longer following those automatic rollover rule. So there's a lot of issues that are intertwined with this escheatment. Um, throughout our work, we're in, um, we work with approximately 40 different states um, at some capacity, and I'm only aware of maybe one state that sheets funds to the state. Um, the rest of them do not. Um, as I talked about, there's really not a lot of direct guidance. There's arguments that can be made. Um, there's concerns that are valid with respect to sheeting funds to the state. Sometimes um, we will hear the pushback argument of, well, it's referenced by the IRS that we can achieve these funds. And that's true, but it's a very narrow reference. So the Internal Revenue uh, Manual talks about terminated defined contribution plans. So for terminated plans, it talks about after a significant effort to locate the participants, then achieving those funds. And that's also um, consistent with, there's um, a really good read out there from the US Government Accountability Office that, that is a report that talks about um, a sheetment, unclaimed retirement uh, funds. And what I think is fascinating is although at a, at a quick glance, um, you may say, well, um, this report uh, solidifies the fact that funds are cheated. They are provided to state unclaimed property. What's important is in the survey, 97% of the funds that were transferred to un unclaimed property came from terminated plans. So we're really not seeing a sheetment of funds from active ongoing plans. Instead, it's really seems to be limited to these terminated plans. Um, the DOL responded to the report and noted that um, there is widespread agreement that more guidance is needed in this area. And the DOL, again, the DOL doesn't apply to governmental plans, but it does provide good guidance that the DOL is looking at issuing additional guidance in the future. Um, the DOL acknowledged that most of the funds that are provided to unclaimed property do come from terminated plans, um, suggesting that ongoing plans really aren't doing this achievement. So we're still watching for additional guidance. Right now, it would be extremely risky to um, transfer funds out of the retirement plan to the state's unclaimed property plan. So we really advise against that practice given the current state of the guidance that we have and what we know other plans are doing, which is they are not transferring funds to unclaimed property. So with that, that concludes our formal presentation.